Working together to make a better community. Welcome to Community Conversations. I'm your host, Steve Mantis, and my guest today is our MP for Thunder Bay Superior North, Patty Haidu, and also the Minister of Health. Welcome, Patty. Great to see you, Steve. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show. We've had you as a guest um, a few times, so you're an old hand at this. Uh, but geez, we're just almost a, um, a year into this pandemic. And you're like the minister of health and it's all about health and like, how are you doing? Oh my gosh, how are you doing? You've been on the spot. It's, uh, it's been a heck of a ride, that's for sure. Um, I'm grateful that I had nine years in public health so that I have a basic foundation and the understandings of public health. And, but uh, nonetheless, I think even with experience in health or healthcare or public health, a pandemic of this size, as you know, Steve, isn't anything that our country or the world has seen in a very, very long time. And so there's been a lot of really rapid uh, adapting, a lot of very difficult decisions having to be made in really, really quick uh, ways. And of course, um, this you're doing this as a team with a group of other ministers uh, who are all responsible for their own portfolios, but you really become aware of how interconnected all of these things that we work on are to, you know, as we go through these decisions together. So it's been, it's been, um, it's still an honor. It's, it's still the honor of my lifetime to be the member of parliament for Thunder Bay Superior North. And it's a huge honor to serve my country in a time of need like this. Uh, but it isn't without its sleepless nights, that's for sure. <laughs> well, you know, I definitely want to say that uh, the folks here in your riding are uh, are always uh, pulling for you. You know, uh, as many of our, our our audience would know, you know, you were the number one politician in the, in our walleye uh, 2020 uh, reader poll, uh, and and you've been consistently there at the top. So uh, we're 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 proud of the job you're doing, and uh, and we're definitely supporting you uh, in any way we can going forward in this kind of crazy time. And I, I feel it. Listen, there, there are, listen, every politician at every level has a plethora of critics and people who think that they should, you know, we should do something different or we've made mistakes. And I will tell you unequivocally, I have made mistakes. Um, I have made mistakes as a politician and I have made mistakes as a human being. Um, but I can also tell you that I know that I'm trying my best and I know that my colleagues are trying their best. And I know that even colleagues at other levels of government who we maybe don't share the same political ideology or the same perspective or even the same um, understanding of how to solve these very difficult problems, I still know that they're trying their best. And it, you know, their, their attempts at um, you know whatever endeavor they're they're pursuing um, might be different than the ones that I'd make, but I'm pretty sure anyone right now who's responsible for anything at a you know organizational level is going to bed at night thinking about COVID and people and that intersection and waking up thinking about COVID and people and how to make it better. So uh, so I'm grateful for that support of Thunder Bay's Pier North and the voters. And, you know, I get so many kind notes and letters and um, I try to reply to them all. And it's just so incredibly heartwarming. So thank you to everyone who's been so kind. And, and as you know, some of our audience will know, I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, I, I have uh, sometimes critical views as well of, of your government and, but overall, you know, I'm just uh, so supportive and pleased with uh, with the work you're doing. I, I think for me, so one I, of the oh, sorry. No, <laughs> well, I was no. just going to say, I was going to say, I think for me, one of the most important decisions we took was at the beginning when we realized that the only way to save lives and help Canadians was to put everything on the table that we could, including financial supports. I remember those very early conversations with then finance bill, uh, Minister Bill Morneau. Um, the night before, actually, we closed borders and all kinds of things happened. Um, he and I, uh, you know, we went for dinner and I said, Bill, uh, this is massive, like billions and billions. And do you remember we went out and announced a billion dollars? And I had said to him, you know, 
it's a great down payment, but it's going to be more <laughs> because in order to help people to do the right thing to save lives, we had to take care of people's economy, um, people's economic realities, whether it was the CERB or wage subsidies or, you know, supporting provinces and territories without quibbling about who pays for what. Those were, I think, very important decisions that we took. And you're right, there are always going to be um, analyses about whether or not it was enough or not, you know, too much, but we did what we could at the time, knowing that um, it was going to take an all hands on deck approach. And and so, Patty, this is is somewhat unique, or maybe totally unique, uh, certainly in my understanding of of history in, in in North America, where governments stepped up to the plate in this massive approach. You know, we go back in history and and during the Depression, you know, in the 30s and 40s we saw governments starting to move in that direction, but this is a whole nother level. Uh, and you know, the critics uh, on one level would say, when are we gonna ever pay this off? You know, this is like huge. Um, how has been the discussion with the finance ministers, with the folks in cabinet, how do people respond to that thought? Like, uh, like, like how can we pay all this off? Well, luckily we have other international institutions that agree that right now is not the time for austerity. I, I laugh mm -hmm. when I say that because can you imagine the alternative if we had said to people, well, we're not going to help you stay home or to small businesses that were shutting their doors. Well, we won't help you cover wages or we won't, we won't be there to help provinces and territories to buy the PPE, which by the way was super expensive because the whole world was searching for it or to get the testing or to invest in the research research and technology or to now buy the vaccines and deliver them door on the doorstep of the province and territory. Imagine if we had said, well, no, we can't afford that. I mean, first of all, there's an obvious, a huge loss of life. You know, people cannot stay home if they can't afford to feed their families. And we've seen that around the world. Countries that haven't been able to afford to do that or countries that have chosen not to do that have had worse outcomes from a death rate perspective, from a mortality perspective, from a case number perspective. But secondly, um, we knew that the economy, if we could suspend it, if you will, by providing wage subsidies for small and me medium-sized businesses that had lost income by providing low interest grants, by providing rent relief, all of the kinds of things that we did. If we knew we could keep people from having to go under and therefore we knew we would lose some of those folks forever, we could actually sort of, sounds strange, but suspend our economy for a bit of a period of time so that we could actually come roaring back when uh, in fact we were more confident from a health perspective. We also knew that you, there, there's a false dichotomy out there, economy or health. And uh, increasingly we're seeing that around the world that it's very, very hard to quote unquote balance the economy and the health initiative or the health imperative. Um, if people are too afraid to go out, then the economy suffers. If people are too sick to go to work, then the economy suffers. If, you know, there, there, that is a false analogy that somehow you have, to, or false dichotomy that you somehow have to pick between one or the other, or that you could kind of balance health. Listen, at the end of the day, um, protecting health is the most fundamental thing you can do to protect the economy. And as the as the Minister of Health, uh, you know, I looked at your mandate letters and I'm kind of going, geez, I'm glad I'm not the Minister of Health. I mean, if I've got three things on my to do list, I figure that's enough. You've got like 35 or something. There's a uh, lot. And 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 so when we think about protecting health, you know, in your mandate letter, there's a number of, of key factors. Uh, you know, one that's uh, in the public uh, discourse right now is, is pharmacare. That's uh, absolutely right. Yeah. Where are and, we at with that? That's as part of your mandate to bring it in. Now it's like COVID's eating up all of our attention. <laughs> How about some of these other important issues? Where, where are we going? Well, quite frankly, for the first several months after being appointed, um, all we were doing was COVID. It was very hard. Uh, you can imagine the capacity of the agencies was fully consumed with COVID. And then with some of the ancillary challenges of COVID from a health perspective, so mental health and substance use, which were um, obviously growing in 
uh, concern along with uh, the impacts on our society. So we spent a lot of time in those first several months really focused on COVID and COVID response. Um, but as we started to stabilize with COVID and may not feel like that, but we are, we're, <laughs> we are stabilizing as a department and how we're managing COVID, um, we were able to refocus on some of these other mandate items, um, including pharmacare. I will note that virtual care, uh, access to primary care through virtual means is coming along really, really well. <laughs> uh, provinces and territories have billing codes now for virtual care, something we thought we were going to have to wrangle out of them there for a while, but uh, lo and behold, I can check that one off. Uh, people have access to primary care in a way that they, in a way that they haven't um, in, in the past solely because of virtual the virtual reality we're living in, no pun intended. Um, but in terms of pharmacare, we have we, we took really important steps in the last mandate and we're we're moving along, I think very well. Uh, there was um, a, a recommitment in budget 2019. There's a Canada drug agency that has stood up. I'm on the cusp of announcing um, an interim lead for the Canada Drug Agency. That person's responsibility will also include coming up with a national formulary. There's some work already being done on the rare disease strategy. In fact, it's out right now for public consultation for families. Provinces and territories have consulted on that already. There are provinces and territories that are excited about pharmacare, others not so excited about pharmacare. But I think that with a growing um, need for pharmaceuticals and a changing landscape that COVID, quite frankly, has has presented to both people, uh, but also employers, I think we'll see a growing appetite even from those provinces that maybe weren't as keen pre-COVID to, to participate. And we've got money. Um, you know, we've got a commitment in budget 2019 and budget 2021, is that where we are right now? <laughs> is just around the corner. And so of course I've been having very important conversations with the Minister of Finance about what we'll need in terms of negotiating with provinces and territories. Obviously we'll expect provinces and territories to put some money in as well. I mean, they have huge budgets right now that they're spending on pharmaceuticals through a variety of different um, uh, public pension plans that, that they run. And there's an opportunity for all of the provinces and territories to see savings if we are more uh, cohesive as a country in how we deal with pharmaceuticals. So we're, we're important steps are we have been taken. But um, uh, I know that uh, I know lots of people were confused about the NDP motion. Um, and yes, our government did vote against it, uh, largely because of the imposition on provinces of territories of specific ways of doing this. And, you know, I will tell you after even just a year in this portfolio, much better to work with them than to impose a model on them. And given that we know that there are provinces uh, and territories in, interested now in what we can do as the next steps, I'm quite confident in our approach. So stay tuned. Budget 2021 will hopefully give you some more clues about the next steps. Well, you know, that really brings me to that dynamic of, of the working relationships around health between the federal government and the provinces and territories. You know, we saw, you know, whatever it was the 20 years ago or so, or 25 years ago, a big shift where the federal government used to fund, you know, Medicare 50-50 with the provinces more or less. And then there was a big focus on reducing costs on the federal level. And, and that relationship seemed to shift and that that kind of contract the 50 50 partnership shifted and it's it, it seemed like at the same time uh there was more flexibility given to the provinces to spend the money as they wished not only in health but in a number of other uh departments as well where there is cost sharing a number of the things on your mandate letters involve those relationships. Uh, the mental health was another one and, and national standards on mental health uh, and access to mental health. Uh, and, and I'm kind of going, okay, how does this play out? Because uh, you can't just decree this happens. There's gotta be some level of, of negotiation and cooperation and the provinces consistently are coming back and saying, Okay, you want us to do this? Where's the money? Yeah, you know. Well, I think going I think back two, to that twenty-five I mean, I years ago. Yeah, I mean, I think two things. You've sort of hit the nail on the head. Um, 
you know, more money and less accountability is not a world that we can live in. I think that COVID has shown us that. I mean, there are different levels of care and long-term care, for example, across the country that are just mm -hmm. abysmal. And, um, you know, I don't think um, now's the time for the provinces and territories to say more money, less accountability. In fact, I think what Canadians are saying is no matter whether I live in BC or Alberta or Ontario, um, I should have an equitable level of care uh, to, to a certain degree. And of course, we know that we know there'll be variations and we know there'll be different ways of delivering that care. But I agree. And I think the challenge has been that um, you know, as you point out, the transfers that we've agreed to have been hard to track. And it's it and, and that is, you know, that is the nature of our federation. We live in a federation where constitutionally the provinces and territories have the right and the responsibility to deliver health care. And the federal government has very little tool uh, tools or we don't have very many levers, if you will, to determine or dictate how that is. But we do have these principles that underline the Canada Health Care Act. And I just tabled, actually, if anyone's interested, the the report on, on the Canada Health Act is tabled every year um, about provinces and territories who have violated those principles, the most important being that care is provided based on need, not on based, not based on ability to pay. And so, um, you know, our government actually reinstated imposing penalties, sounds ironic, by financial penalties to provinces and territories saying, if we have evidence that you are allowing billing for care that should be considered free uh, or equitably accessed by your population, then we will apply penalties. And so a number of provinces did receive penalties and they range depending on the amount of billing evidence that we have that has happened, um, most notably New Brunswick, which does not have equitable access to reproductive services, including abortion. And, and there was a clinic that was um, forced into a position of having to bill people to cover their costs as they weren't funded by the province. Those are the kinds of situations where we can exert some pressure. We also during the COVID um, safe transfer agreements, um, $19 billion went to provinces and territories. Very, very hard to negotiate um, specific measurements. And we saw, we saw what happened. I mean, some provinces and territories rapidly scaled up, uh, for example, um, testing capacity or data capacity or uh, provided the top up pay to essential workers. Other provinces, not so much. In fact, you know, we saw some provinces um, sitting on money and it was unspent even as late as uh, end of this summer or early fall. 93 cents of every dollar spent on COVID has come from the federal government. So we're there, but we do need um, with these types of transfers, I think Canadians expect us to agree on some outcome measurements that demonstrate that they're getting they're getting their money's worth. And I think um, that's always those are always delicate discussions because again back to the constitution the provinces and territories do have the jurisdiction to deliver health care and the, the federal government say a, a, a powerful partner in that but we do um, we do have some limits in terms of control that we can apply and and so in a way this is this is such tricky issues uh, so you know 93 percent of the costs have been covered by the federal government. That's so unique, right? In terms of- It is. I mean, take vaccination, funding. for example. Normally, influenza vaccines are purchased by the provinces and territories, and we do the purchasing for them, but they actually are built for those um, medical ingredients. And we, uh, when we purchased the vaccines, you know, uh, um, very expensive, we decided that this was not the time to um, charge the provinces and territories for what we considered an essential ingredient to Canadians health and to the uh, our economic health as well um, the same on on rapid tests and and testing supplies uh, the same on personal protective equipment uh, so we you know we've been in that space of not squ not squabbling and uh, not quibble quabbling with the uh, provinces and territories on covid because the, there was a mission critical uh, goal here, um, but we do expect uh, with some longer standing programming money um, that there are uh, there are standards that are developed and, and this has been difficult. It was started by my predecessor, Jane Philpott, as you know, in the area of mental health um, and those standards are, are underway and I think we're getting close to a conclusion. Um, but the, it, but it's a new a newer way of doing healthcare transfers for sure. And um, you know, not everyone's a fan, but I think Canadians by and large want to know uh, how come they live in a province, for example, where they can't access uh, safe supply uh, uh, for, for substance use, you know, which is uh, 
um, a point of contention for folks that live in some provinces that ideologically are opposed to harm reduction. And, and so this is, you know, I think both in terms of access to mental health and certainly access to, um, you know, uh, uh, I forget the terms now, I'm getting too old, you know, to <laughs> be on top of the, of the discussion, but, but in terms of like uh, supporting safe practices uh, yeah, around harm reduction, yeah. harm reduction that, that um, we don't have really good access in lots of, of, of Canada. And, and it seems like they're kind of the poor cousins in terms of our public health. Well, we can um, certainly see do, that. Do, um, do we see that, that the federal government using that same approach of, of being willing to put more resources into these areas uh, that might make a difference? Well, I think if we can be certain that the money is going to actually um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, result in real change for people on the ground. And that's always the challenge with the request for transfers. Listen, I was a minister of employment. We had very similar conversations around skills training transfers, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's always a delicate balance. How much do you want to control as a federal government? Uh, how much should you control as a federal government? How much do you leave up to provinces, territories, even regions? To determine for themselves and certainly if you're talking about indigenous people there are also now treaties and self-governance decisions and, and criteria so i think those are always really important conversations but listen at the end of the day um no one can argue that the federal government has not been very present in the space of health funding and um for a whole bunch of things including um, including support for mental health and substance use direct to Canadians. We have now, as you know, wellnesstogether.ca. If you don't know about it, I hopefully you'll put that up for your viewers. It's a online portal for mental health support that includes not just uh, self-assessment tools and the like, but also direct connection to professionals completely paid for by the federal government. You know, millions and millions, um, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars um, towards uh, support for mental health and substance use through a variety of direct to community streams of funding. And in some ways, that's very um, um, effective. I mean, Wellness Together gets directly to Canadians, uh, anonymous, you can, you, can, you can speak to a counselor, you can text with a counselor, you can, you can get a virtual visit, um, counselor, social worker, um, and, uh, uh, you know, regardless of where you live in the country in both official languages, this is new for the gov federal, federal government to provide uh, um, services directly to Canadians. Now, the services we're purchasing from other service providers, but it is, um, it's independent of provincial governments. In terms of mental health and substance use funding, uh, uh, I have a fund funding stream under Health Canada called the Substance Use SUAP, Substance Use Access Program, I think it's called, uh, assistance program, goes directly to communities. So communities apply for three to five year projects on safe supply, on harm reduction, and we fund directly to communities. And, you know, it's great for uh, communities because they have um, an ability then to be very responsive to the needs of their community members, uh, regardless of the state of their provincial politics which means that, and, and often, by the way, uh, community members uh, know, community groups know what community members need. So you have an ability then, for example, in Vancouver, they have a number of grants around safe supply and prescribing of, um, of uh, medication, prescription opioids to get people off street opioids so that they can reduce overdose deaths. Uh, others have used it to uh, provide other harm reduction services. We've got some research on managed alcohol programs happening right now, which is neat to see as someone who used to, um, as you know, I used to be involved in that with the shelter house. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think we're, as a federal government, progressively leaning into a variety of different ways to support Canadians, whether it's direct to Canadians, direct to communities, or working on provinces and territories to have more accountability around uh, healthcare spending. Uh, so we're, we're nearing the end of, of our time together, Patty, uh, but one of the items in your mandate letter caught my attention, which was uh, to promote healthy eating. Uh, and, you know, this was, you know, 50 years ago, that was my time to learn about healthy mm -hmm. eating when I, you know, had to live on my own and, and figure out, you know, how to do that. 
what what are you doing around promoting healthy eating? Um, well, what, what, what's yeah. involved in that initiative? Well, it's a, it's an interesting space. You know, we we did um, upgrade the Canada Food Guide to much acclaim uh, just prior to the last election, which was a big piece of work. It sounds like it shouldn't be, but it was. Lots of people involved in that work, and it um, reflected the changing knowledge that we have around what's healthy to eat and in what quantity. Um, including a, a decreased reliance on meat products, as you know, and um, um, also some culturally, culturally specific um, foods to reflect the cultural diversity of Canada. Um, I, I'll also say that we've been working with the industry, food industry on front of pack labeling, which is something that has been ongoing for the last couple of years. This is a space that got heavily disrupted by COVID, um, obviously very hard to do um, this work while uh, you know everybody's retooling for pandemic purposes, but we still have our eye on it because, of course, it's essential. And we do know that uh, obesity is is uh, a risk to Canadians, and we have uh, uh, we have two thirds of Canadians that are overweight or obese. So that's. Um, a health risk to for it's an underlying condition for many other conditions and most recently research around COVID um, has demonstrated that obesity is um, one of the risk factors for severe um, outcomes including death from COVID so we've got more work to do in that space and I'm excited to get back into the healthy eating work but um, again it's been uh, COVID disrupted like some of these other pieces that are a little bit longer in um, in in process, I would say. And and you know, folks that uh, are involved in poverty reduction would say, you know, people in poverty oftentimes don't eat healthy food because they can't afford it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, even if they know what's what's the right thing. And of course, now with whatever the reasons, boy, that. The prices in the supermarket have been going up for sure. Well, there's some how really you, good reasons. I mean, with... we've, yeah. you know, the food chains have been disrupted, and it just goes to show you this how much we've relied all around the world on temporary farm workers and um, the various mm -hmm. uh, ways that we've kept our food prices low often intersect with uh, with uh, people who have been underpaid for. Uh, for work for a very long time. Yeah, no, listen, I would say that you have to work on it from both ends, um, from the end of awareness and education, which, you know, is a uh, old tool in public health, uh, helping people understand what they're eating, having better transparency and what's in food, which is the front of pack labeling. There's a lot of sugars and fats packed into food that we don't, we're not aware of, including salt, uh, you know, there's tons of sort of ingredients that we're not aware we're consuming, especially with processed food. Um, but I think you're absolutely right. The other end is is the prevention piece. And, you know, the, the prevention piece is making sure that people do have not just the awareness, but the ability to get uh, better food. And that's why poverty work is so important. That's why Canada Child Benefit is so important. You know, not we don't talk about it as much, but we doubled the Canada Child Benefit during COVID, um, you know, a couple times so that we could actually make sure, I'm not sure if it was doubled, I should check my facts, but we increased Canada Child Benefit significantly a couple times during the pandemic so that we could make sure families were getting enough food. We funded not-for-profits directly through the United Way of Canada. Uh, some of that money landed here in Thunder Bay to Roots to Harvest, do, do drop in other food providers, RFDA, um, you know, for food access. But uh, uh, income is important, you know, making sure that people have enough to live on is important because as much as we want to support feeding programs, for me, it's always about uh, choice and autonomy, you know, and uh, dignity. And the best way to do that is to make sure that people have an opportunity to, to, to be able to to uh, financially uh, make it. That's why things like CERB was so important. You know, how could people feed themselves and stay at home if they didn't have a have a basic sort of uh, amount of money to live on? And so the two thousand dollars a month for CERB um, provided people with a financial security and the ability to. Um, you know, the ability to eat, even if they lost their job. And, uh, you know, that's one of the areas that I think as a government, we've been very focused on. I, I, I got to jump in, Patty. Uh, we're out of time. We're going to, you know, the big machine's going to come and just cut us off regardless. Uh, I want to keep talking about this I stuff, know, we could talk about it time. forever. I'll come back. Oh, I my promise. gosh. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. And, uh, and um, you know, 
keep on uh, doing good work and and uh, and let's make it an inclusive society for all of us. That's Thanks the goal, so much. Steve. Equity is good for all of our health. <laughs> Talk to you soon. Exactly. Working together to make a better community.